Good morning. This is the call to the prelude. So this morning, uh, Logan will be playing It Is Well With My Soul. So if you want to follow along or sing along, that'd be great as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Amen. Hopefully it is well with your soul this morning. Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, Providence Baptist Church. We're glad you're with us to worship our God together this morning. We're going to go over just a few announcements on pages two and three of your uh, worship guide. So if you'll turn to pages two and three, we'll go over just a few announcements before we begin our service today. I'm going to start at page three, where you have a reminder of your adult Sunday school classes. 
Uh, also on the calendar, uh, you can see there that we'll observe the Lord's table together uh, this morning, and we'll have a fellowship meal after the Sunday school hour. So uh, if you weren't planning to stay, or maybe you're a guest with us and you didn't know that, uh, well, I'm sure there will be plenty to go around, so please uh, plan to stay and uh, get to know some of the folks here uh, as we will have a fellowship meal. We usually do that on the first Sunday of every month. So you can see the next one will be uh, December the 1st. And then just remember that November the 27th, that's the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we will not have any uh, Wednesday evening activities uh, here at the church uh, that evening. Also, uh, uh, one thing that's not on there today is, uh, please make a note, uh, November the 17th, that will be Sunday, November the 17th, uh, we will have a members meeting, mainly to talk about uh, the budget proposal uh, for the upcoming year. So that's uh, usually been one of our shorter meetings, but uh, again, uh, anyway, a members meeting on uh, November the 17th after Sunday school, mainly to uh, go over the, the budget proposal for the upcoming year. And then you'll see there uh, July 4 through 6 is a save the date for our 25th anniversary. Uh, there will be, uh, I think, more details to come on that. And you'll see our Lord's Supper policy is there, so if you're uh, a guest with us, uh, please read over that, and uh, yeah, if you're planning to visit us for a while, uh, we would just ask that you would uh, uh, to speak with uh, one of the elders uh, about your situation, and that and, uh, yeah, will go from there on that. So please read over the Lord's Supper policy. Uh, on back on page two, uh, those. Announcements there are directed mainly to our guests, so if you are a guest with us, we're glad you're here. We're glad that uh, you're uh, visiting us, and uh, please read through those. If you have any questions, find someone nearby and ask your questions, and uh, we'll try to get them answered. And just know that in between our service and our Sunday school time, we usually have a, about a 20-minute, 20, 20 to 30-minute break. We have coffee, juice, and uh, donuts out here in the fellowship hall. So, any other announcements, perhaps, that I've missed or that I'm not sure about or I've forgotten? Okay, well, if not, Logan will play another song, I believe, for us. It's going to be Amazing Grace as we uh, continue to prepare our hearts together for worship this morning.
turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'll be reading verses 12 through 17 as we begin our worship service. Since we're just going to sing one song before our next reading. Let's stand as we read God's word together. We stand to sing so you can sing more full. We stand as we read the word of God at times in reverence and honor to its authority over our lives. First Timothy chapter one, verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we've come this morning uh, from the many avenues and streams of life together to bring praise and honor to worship you. You are God who has been merciful to save us sinners along with Paul. You are Father who is declared to be the king of the ages, sovereign heavenly father to your people, immortal and invisible. You are the only God. And it's only through our reigning Lord Jesus Christ that we have access to you and so we come with grateful hearts for that provision there's christ seated at your right hand reigning over all things interceding in your spirit interceding also on our behalf as we don't always know how to pray or what to pray Father, we thank you that your word teaches. We thank you that the church is growing through Christ. And though at times it seems like the world is gaining the upper hand, the gates of hell will not prevail against the the going forth of your people. Father, help us. We come this morning, we declare you the one to whom we direct all of our thoughts, all of our attention. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, Father, and willingness to apply. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, if you'll grab your hymnal and remain standing, we'll be at hymn 36 this morning, hymn 36. All right, kids out there, can, I, can we see God? Yeah, we cannot see God, but he always sees us, right? For God is a spirit and has not a body like men. And so let us sing this morning, Immortal, Invisible. Let's sing together. Open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We'll read verses 38 to 48. Then we'll have a congregational prayer of confession and thanksgiving. And then we'll look at an assurance of our pardon in Jesus. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 38, beginning in 38, this is Jesus speaking. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you, and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? 
And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, uh, this time of confession and thanksgiving is so important for us as a body. And we do come before you now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we need to confess. We are not perfect as the command that was given to us by the Lord to be perfect as you are perfect. Father, we often, daily, moment by moment, are imperfect. Not only that, Father, but we sin. We sin willingly. We sin without knowing. We commit sins by not doing what we ought. And we sin by doing what we ought not. Oh, Father, we do come before you and ask forgiveness. Father, we are reminded that you have granted forgiveness to those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who rest on his grace and mercy. And so, Father, we praise your name for this. You are a great and mighty God, saving those that you call because of your goodness. Father, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As an assurance of our pardon, I'm going to turn to the scriptures listed there, Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And what is that name? Jesus Christ. In Romans 10, 11, I'm going to start just a little bit early. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved, and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Put together, these verses give us great comfort that there's salvation in Jesus Christ for all who believe in him. There's salvation in no other name, and no other name by which men must be saved. Amen. Amen. Well, grab your hymnals. Go to 405. I was just putting together, since we're hearing the rain this morning, the last song we sang, the very last uh, line of verse 2 says, Thy clouds, which are fountains of goodness and love, and then Dennis just read for us, he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Well, this is good. We needed the rain. Sometimes... Uh, I grew up on a farm in Minnesota, and sometimes I forget how important it is to, to have rain now that I live in the city, but it is good that uh, God is sending us the rain. Well, let's go to uh, 405, and this song reminds us, as Dennis said, there is salvation in no other name but that of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not because of anything we've done. It is only because of Christ. So let us stand and remind each other of that and encourage each other to, uh, to, to run to Christ and to trust Christ. 
Let's sing together. We'll sing our hymn of the month before uh, Corey comes with our message this morning. 152, reminding us to find our rest in Jesus Christ. Let's sing together.
All right. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 5. Um, this morning, we'll be considering the righteousness that God requires of us. The sermon title is a mouthful, but it's the, well, a righteousness that surpasses the righteousness of the righteous. So, one of the words you at least will be familiar with, or at least you can hear over and over. Um, but as I mentioned last week, um, I'm departing from our main diet, our main course of Lectio Continua, which means consecutive preaching, or consecutive reading is really the, the literal translation there, but where we typically go through books of the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And I am convinced that that's the main diet, that should, that, that should be the main diet for our congregation. Um, but there are times in the life of the church when it's appropriate um, to preach on specific topics or specific doctrines um, that are revealed to us in Scripture. And, and I won't go into this. If you want to talk about this more, there are, there's biblical warrant and historical warrant um, for this type of preaching. Uh, but over the next few weeks, we'll consider topics such as the law and the gospel, and then, Lord willing, we'll um, go through the doctrines of grace. Um, that's the plan, as long as the Lord wills. Um, but for today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, considering the topic of righteousness. I'll go ahead and read our passage, um, verses 17 through 20, and then I will pray a pastoral prayer. So Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, it is such a privilege to come before you. And we come before you through the blood of Jesus Christ and by your Spirit who has brought us from death to life. And I pray, 
I pray that you would continue the work that you've begun in us. Continue to remove the remaining pollution of our sin. Make us to hate our transgressions. Make us to love you and your kingdom. And I pray that you will open the eyes of many this very morning to see the glorious truths of your word and to see the amazing grace of your gospel. And that in Christ we might say it is well with our souls. I also pray for our nation. I pray that you might be pleased to never take away the gospel from this place, from this nation. I pray for the witness of your church in what is becoming a dry and weary land. But I pray that there would continue to be a witness to your truth. I pray that there would continue to be the gospel testimony going forth, that proclamation going forth. And I also pray for whoever you have appointed to be our next president. I pray that our next president will punish evil and reward good. I pray for the souls of both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. Oh, save their souls. Open their eyes to behold your wonderful, wonderful truth. And open their eyes to, and their hearts to desire and to long for your blessed kingdom. And I pray that no matter what happens this Tuesday, I pray that your church will be strengthened and sanctified in the truth. Oh God, help us this morning to be free from distractions. Help us to listen carefully to your word. Oh, give us ears to hear and eyes to see your glory. And I pray this in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So I'm sure that many of you at some point in your life have asked the question, how do I know I'm a Christian? How do you know? How do we know that we're a Christian? Well, the other day I came across a preacher and he said, you know you're a Christian when righteousness is the pattern of your life. So this preacher's response is to examine the righteous pattern of your life to know whether you're a Christian. At first, I would say this sounds good, um, but when we follow this line of reasoning, we have to ask another question. If the assurance of my Christian faith is the pattern of righteousness in my life, how righteous must I be? Think about that. If my assurance to know that I'm a Christian is based on the pattern of righteousness in my life, how righteous must I be? Well, that's the question we'll, Lord willing, answer this morning from Matthew chapter 5. So our passage here in Matthew chapter 5 is um, found in the middle or in the midst of what is often referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, In this sermon, Jesus teaches on the law. And he shows just how far its demands go. Um, But before he expounds upon the law, before he's going to turn to the moral law, we'll, we'll define that a little bit more later. But before he turns to the moral law, he's going to describe his relationship to the law. And he's going to reinforce the righteous demands of the law here in verses 17 through 20. So I've divided into two sections. Verses 17 and 18 is where we see Jesus' relationship to the law. And then verses 19 and 20, where he will establish or really reinforce God's righteous standard. And by the time we get to the end of the sermon, um, it's my hope to answer the question, how righteous must I be to be a Christian, and then the implication, how righteous must I be to know that I am a Christian? So to help us with this passage, with with this sermon here, I'm going to define three terms. When we get to the third, I'll just kind of flow into the sermon from there. Um, But the first definition here is the law and the prophets. You'll see in verse 17, the law or the prophets— and then in verse 17, or verse 18, towards the end, he talks about the law. 
So we have the law or the prophets, and then we have the law. Well, the law here is a reference to the law of Moses, which will encompass, as many of you know, the first five books of the Bible. And then the prophets in this use is referring really to the rest of the Old Testament. Um, Depending on who you read and who you hear, um, oftentimes you'll hear some men like Abraham, men like Joshua, men like like David even referred to as prophets. Um, And so, Anyways, I use that, bring that up just to say it's not uncommon for that word to refer to all of the Old Testament. But sometimes in the New Testament, the Old Testament scriptures will be referred to as Moses and the prophets. Other times, it'll be referred to as the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then at other times, it'll simply be the law and the prophets. So what we have here in verse 17 is law and prophets, meaning all of the Old Testament scriptures. So this is a reference to the first five books, and then this is a reference to all the rest. So Jesus, when he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, he's referring to all that we find in the Old Testament. So that's our first definition. Second definition is righteousness. We'll get to this later, we'll, we'll, we'll expand upon this, but in verse 20, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. So, righteousness, common term, we use it a lot in the church, but what does it mean? Well, if you looked in a Greek dictionary, you would find something like this, doing what is right or doing what God requires. So, when we refer to God's righteousness— We're referring to his intrinsic goodness, to his intrinsic rightness. God is right in all he does because he is right, because he is good inherently. God is righteous and he always does right. When we refer to God's righteous requirements of man, we're talking about an uprightness that is both internal and external. God's righteous requirements refer to more than just external obedience, more than just what we do. And we see this in Jesus' exposition of the law. He will say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Let's look at a couple of examples. Verse 21, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder. Simple enough, don't murder, stay from murder, keep from murdering. But then verse 22, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So we see here, now all of a sudden, internal, the the heart. So don't murder, external, but I say to you, anyone who is angry, so internally angry with his brother is liable to judgment, more than just external obedience. Verse 27, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Simple enough, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So now we're going beyond just the external physical act to the heart of the matter. So Jesus here is teaching us essentially that righteousness refers to more than just external obedience. So as we see in our passage, righteousness refers to both being right and doing right. And I don't mean being right in in an argument. I mean being right within, being good, being righteous within, and therefore doing right. We'll expand upon that later. And one more definition is fulfill. And this one will just get right into the passage here. But fulfill, as we see in verse 17, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. What does it mean to fulfill? What to fulfill is to complete, to give the true meaning to something, or provide the real significance of something. So to fulfill is to show the real intent or the real purpose of something. So the real purpose for which something was given. On multiple occasions in Matthew's gospel, we read something like this. This took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. So we see that idea bringing to its intended meaning, the intended purpose by which something was stated or said. And then when John, he, if you remember, 
he initially refused to baptize Jesus. I mean, he, he says, no, I need to be baptized by you. But what does Jesus say? It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So as we see in the book of Matthew, Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness. He came to show the meaning of righteousness. He came to show the real purpose, the real intent of the law and the prophets. And that's what he's saying here in verse 17. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Notice he says, don't think I've come. So Jesus comes to earth, son of God. Here's something that'll bake your noodle, but he didn't leave heaven as God. As God, he's, he, he, he's everywhere, right? Where is God? God is everywhere. So as God, he doesn't leave heaven, but in the incarnation, he comes to earth. He is sent by the Father to show the intended purpose for which the Old Testament scriptures were written. All the types, all the prophecies, all the commands of the law find their fulfillment and substance in Christ. So the Old Testament scriptures, they speak about him. They testify to him. And now here he is, the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Some of you will be familiar with this term, dispensationalism. Um, but the dispensational hermeneutic, so the dispensational interpretive um, grid, misses this. Misses Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Because dispensationalism in general terms makes a sharp distinction between Old and New. The Old Testament, New Testament. Makes a sharp distinction between Israel and the church. You could even say, and there's different nuance here, but dispensationalism holds to different redemptive programs for Israel and the church. And as Sam Waldron observes, dispensationalism misses Jesus as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets because dispensationalism sees the resurrection of Judaism in the millennium as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So looking forward to a future resurrection of Judaism, missing Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. That's why some dispensational teachers will look at Matthew 5 through 7 as a future kingdom ethic. They'll place so much weight on future national Israel in which a temple will be rebuilt according to the dispensationalist. And a sacrificial system will be reinstituted. They'll put so much in there that they will miss this. And so some will preach Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as a future kingdom ethic, not something to be applied to us today. But as we see here, and as we see in the book of Hebrews, if we were to turn there, Jesus came to fulfill these things. That which Old Testament Israel was meant to be. Jesus, the Son of God, sent by the Father, full of the Spirit, to fulfill the purposes of Old Testament Israel. Israel was a set-apart nation through whom God's revelation came forth. And this revelation culminated in the incarnation of the Son of God, the Messiah. So when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he inaugurated the new covenant in his blood. And as the mediator of the new covenant, he does not make the Old Testament scriptures null and void. Yes, there are particular laws that belong explicitly to the old covenant. Laws such as the sacrificial laws, the purity laws, dietary laws, civil laws, etc. But as we learn from here, Jesus didn't come to replace these things. He came to fulfill them. I heard one pastor say, it's not replacement theology, it's fulfillment theology. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets and to mediate a better covenant, which is enacted on better promises than the old. He didn't come to abolish and replace, he came to fulfill. And to reinforce that he didn't come to undo the scriptures, look at what he says in verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. 
by iota and by dot here, Jesus is saying not even the smallest, most minuscule part of the Old Testament will pass away until all is accomplished. He's saying nothing that is written will fail to be accomplished. The word of the Lord will fulfill the purpose for which it goes forth. And you can count on that. Heaven and earth will not pass away until all comes to be. William Hendrickson in his commentary says, nothing whatever will remain lacking as to fulfillment. God's program with respect to Christ, the church, mankind in general, the universe will be carried out in full. So Jesus, he didn't come to abrogate or or do away with the law. He is the fulfillment of it. Not one thing in the Old Old Testament scriptures will pass away until all is accomplished, until all is fulfilled. So with that in mind, I think it might be helpful for us to take a little digression here. I'll talk more about this next week. But it's often confusing when we think about the Mosaic Law. Specifically, like I say, the, the, the law that's mediated through Moses that's going to become to national Israel, that's going to exist in ceremonial laws that'll govern their worship, um, civil laws that govern their, their daily life, their public affairs, and then moral law, which would be the moral law coming from God. And so, the, while there's many things in the Mosaic law that belong specifically to national Israel, just think dietary laws for one, the moral law transcends national Israel. So that means the moral law, which is summarized in the Ten Commandments. If you think Ten Commandments, that's a summary of your moral law. If you think even further than that, Jesus summarizes the Ten Commandments as love God with your whole being, love your neighbor as yourself, moral law. So the moral law existed before the Mosaic Covenant. So before God, well, before God mediated, gave a, a law to Israel through Moses, the moral law existed before that. And the moral law continues after the Mosaic Covenant is fulfilled. Another way to say that, the moral law existed before Old Testament Israel became a nation. And it continues to exist after Old Testament Israel ceased to be a nation. I bring this to your attention because Jesus is not opening the door for lawlessness. He's not opening the door to relax the law or set up a milder law. Yes, there are particular aspects of the old covenant that have been fulfilled in Christ and are no more. Those things were for national Israel in the Old Testament. Dietary laws. There were laws pertaining to civil laws in terms of how you punish a criminal. Um, You know, stealing. If you steal, if you steal a sheep, you have to repay four sheep back. That repayment, that restitution belongs to Israel. But the law to not steal transcends national Israel belongs to the moral law. And so, that which belonged to Israel, those aspects of the old covenant are no longer binding upon the people of God because these aspects of the law belong to national Israel. But the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments transcends national Israel. The moral law reflects God's character, the holiness of his nature. Therefore, the moral law does not change. Its demands are not here one day and then gone the next because God doesn't change. Although Jesus fulfills the demands of the moral law, the moral law is with us. The moral law remains because the moral law is based on God's character. Therefore, the moral law is just as binding today as it was for national Israel. Think about just the command, do not murder. We've looked at that earlier. You shall not murder. Belongs to the moral law. That was not specific to national Israel. We see that even before Israel becomes a nation in the book of Genesis. This command is rooted in the character of God and revealed to us in nature. So if you get nothing from that, just know this. The Mosaic Covenant The covenant given to Israel that required certain dietary restrictions, sacrifices to be made, um, different, you know, 
penalties for breaking the law, stoning people for different laws, the law breaking, those things, gone. Those, that, that, that was specific to national Israel. But the moral law remains as the standard of righteousness. So in the first two verses of this passage, we see Jesus' relationship to the Old Testament. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament writings. The Old Testament testifies to Christ, and the Old Testament finds its fulfillment in Christ. But that doesn't make for a lawless people. It doesn't make for a lawless society. That is not at all what Jesus is saying here. It, it's probable that up to this point in time, Jesus had been accused already of relaxing the law. Um, I mean, or, or he at least expects this to happen because he knows that that's what's going to happen. People will come along and will accuse him of relaxing the law because they saw him as a, as a lawbreaker. Why did they see this? Well, he did miracles on the Sabbath. Healing on the Sabbath, you're working on the Sabbath, so therefore you're breaking the law. Uh, and there's other things as well that people saw him as a blasphemer. How can you say, I am, before Abraham was, I am? So people will accuse Jesus of breaking the law, of being a lawbreaker, of relaxing the law. But as we're going to see here, and, and as we already see, Jesus didn't come to do away or abolish the law to abolish the Old Testament scriptures, but to fulfill them. And so now in verses 19 and 20, Jesus will teach on God's righteous standard. And this will lead us back to our question, how righteous must I be to be a Christian? And then how righteous must I be to know that I am a Christian? So in verse 19, Jesus, is te he's teaching here that the law must not be relaxed one bit. The commandments must not be relaxed at all. So to relax the standard, to teach others to do the same, is actually to break the law. To loosen the standard is to break it all. I mean, just think about it like this. What is God's standard? What does God require? Does he require merely sincere obedience, just as long as you try to obey? Is that God's requirement of us? Well, I tried. I know I failed, but I tried to obey. I mean, you're speeding down the road. You're going 30 miles per hour over the speed limit, and you tell an officer who pulls you over, you know what? I tried to obey the law. How's that going to work out for you? I think you get the idea. So no, it's not just I tried. What about partial obedience? As long as you obey some of the time, is that good? Now, I know some of you parents would actually like partial obedience for your children because you think that they never obey. But, but think about it. Is that okay? Just to obey some of the time? What, what, what does that look like? I obey when I feel like it? Well, I, I obey today, but I don't obey tomorrow. Is that God's righteous standard? No, absolutely not. What does God require? Look at verse 48 of chapter 5. Dennis read this earlier. You, therefore, must be what? Perfect. As your heavenly Father is perfect. Perfection. Now, that changes things a little bit, doesn't it? The standard is perfection, not imperfect perfection, whatever that means. But, but that's the standard we're inclined to promote, we say things, you know, think things, as long as I'm committed to righteousness, God will accept that. Or as long as I love God the best I can, God will accept that. But God's word said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It doesn't say you must try to be perfect. It doesn't say you must commit to be perfect. It says you must be perfect. Perfection. That's the standard. That is God's standard. We must be perfect in every way, both inside and out. Not one imperfect thought, not one lustful thought, not one angry thought that is unrighteous, not one imperfection. We must be perfect all the way because perfect's not imperfect. Perfect is total all the way. 
Even one sin, we talked about this last week, one sin proves our unrighteousness. Remember, a healthy tree will not produce diseased fruit. Someone who is truly righteous will not do anything unrighteous. Even one mishap proves that you are a lawbreaker, that you are unrighteous. Therefore, to relax the law, that just proves our need for a lesser standard. And that proves our unrighteousness. I mean, the only reason we relax the law, only reason we relax the standard is because we're unable to fulfill it. And this just reinforces the the reality that we are unrighteous. But our unrighteousness, that does not lessen God's standard. For as we see in verse 19, the one who relaxes the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps the commandments, whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And I I labored to understand exactly what this means. What's it mean to be least or great in the kingdom of heaven? Um, And I'm not sure. Uh, And I I felt great comfort in the fact that I read Sam Waldron say the same thing. Uh, Honestly, I don't know what that means. Um, But I'll quote Matthew Poole. He's a a 17th century English Puritan. Um, He refers to the kingdom of heaven as the church. And he says, the one who violates the commands and interprets them falsely shall be accounted of the least value and esteem in the church of God and shall never come into the kingdom of glory. And as for the one who keeps the commandment and teaches others to do the same, that man shall have a great renown and reputation in the church, which is the kingdom of heaven upon earth, and shall have a great reward in the kingdom of glory hereafter. So he's making a distinction there, saying that this is in the church, that that, that idea, I, I don't know if that's right or not. But the, so while the particulars aren't clear, at least to me, maybe to you, you can help me later, but the sense of this verse is clear. The standard of the law, perfection. No room to relax that standard. No room to relax the law. We must keep it all in full, in its totality. The law says, do this and live. It also says, disobey and be under the curse. If you do not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them, you'll be cursed. That's what the law says. So to relax the law actually relaxes the standard and it relaxes the, 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 the condemnation of the law. Because the law, what it does is it shows us what's required of us. And here we see this contrast between relaxing it and between keeping it. And clearly, the one to be preferred is the one who does and teaches them, who does not relax the law. Because the law shows us who we are, shows us what we've done, shows us, it's, it's a mirror showing us that we don't measure up. The law only shows us what's required of us. The law does not provide us with the means to uphold the law. But it does show us what's required, and that's total exact and perpetual obedience. There's no room for incomplete or partial obedience. God's righteous requirement is perfection. If that's what you're striving after, how are you doing? How are you doing? How perfect is your life? You might say, well, compared to so-and-so, I'm doing pretty good. But is that the standard? Who's the standard? God, revealed to us in Jesus Christ, is the standard. The standard is not to look at your child and say, you know what, in comparison to my child, I'm doing pretty well. Or in comparison to whoever you might think is the worst person possible person on this earth and say, compared to them, I'm doing pretty good. The standard's perfection. It's not comparative to one another. It's God's not grading on a curve. 
well, you know what? If you ever were in a class where, where your teacher gave a curve and then one person got 100, everybody else got like 40s, you despise that person because you're like, that person just ruined the curve. Think about us in light of Christ. I mean, he throws the curve out. The curve never existed. But you think about him in comparison to us, there's not even, we're not even close. It's not like he makes a perfect score and we just made an imperfect score. It was like a 40, he made 100. No, that's not, the, the gap is so far. The gap is so wide. The gap, and that's what the law shows us. The law shows us the perfection that God requires of us. And then Christ comes to show us the intended meaning and he shows us that perfection. He is light shining in darkness. Why do you think everybody hated him? Because he exposed and showed us what true righteousness really is. So Jesus here in verse 20, now he tells us how righteous we must be to enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 20, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let me ask you, is that good news? Is this good news? This is terrible news. Our righteousness must be greater than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. I mean, it's important to note Jesus is not saying that they're the standard of righteousness. He's actually saying their righteousness is not enough. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were known for their righteousness. They were known for how holy they were. They even created extra laws to keep from breaking laws. But as Jesus is saying here, even their righteousness is not enough. And then the people listening, your righteousness must surpass, it must exceed the righteousness of the most righteous people you know. Look at the righteous among you. The, that group over there, they're the righteous group. They're the ones who always do right. Well, your righteousness must, be, must surpass that. And those who had ears to hear, they would hear this and think, what hope do I have? If my righteousness must succeed or must, must surpass, must exceed the most righteous people I know, what hope do I possibly have? So what Jesus is preaching here is actually terrible news for the sinner. The righteous requirements are, of God are a terror to the unrighteous. And that's where the law leaves us. It leaves us with the standard of perfect righteousness. If we were to walk through the law, if I was to do an exposition on the Ten Commandments or to come here in Matthew 5 and show what the requirements are, it leaves us hopeless. It leaves us in despair. What hope do I have? Especially when I look at these religious people and I think, I've got to be more righteous than they. How could I ever measure up? How? How will you ever meet this standard? Well, you won't. But you must if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. We don't relax it and say, you know what, we're going to bring the bar down a lot. That's the thing, we've got to bring it down a lot. We're going to bring the debt bar down, way down here, so we can get to heaven. God doesn't do that. We do that because we know that we can't meet that standard. We can't meet it. We are imperfect. We are sinners. We are unrighteous. So the law leaves us hopeless. And this is what makes the good news so great. God owes you nothing but condemnation. Wrath, fury, yet he sent the Son to save his people from their sins. The beginning of the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 21, we read that Mary will bear a son, she will call his name Jesus. And why will she call his name Jesus? Because he will save his people from their sins. And how will he save his people from their sins? By fulfilling the law and the prophets. By fulfilling all righteousness. The righteousness that we need to enter the kingdom of God. 
is the righteousness of another. Because we'll never be righteous on our own. As Paul writes in Philippians 3, 9, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. The righteousness we need comes through faith in Christ because he fulfilled all righteousness. And he did so because he's inherently righteous. And so when we consider Christ, his law keeping in light of our law breaking, we ought to marvel. I mean, just a few things to consider. As a baby and as a toddler, he never threw a fit because he didn't get his way. I know sometimes we focus on our kids throwing fits, but how many of you grown-ups here have thrown a fit recently? Jesus never got upset because he didn't get his way. As a boy, as a teenager, he never caved to temptation. Not once. He never stole from his siblings. He never coveted. He never blasphemed. He loved God with his whole being and his neighbor as himself. He kept every law under the old covenant. And he fulfilled all its righteous demands. And now through faith in Christ, his righteousness is credited to our account. In the words of Caspar Olivian, a 16th century German reformer, he said, the righteousness of Christ is ours, a gift to us, granted as if it were from us. His righteousness is credited to us as though it was our very own. So how righteous must we be to enter the kingdom of heaven? We must be as righteous as Christ. Therefore, our only hope is to look to Christ and to his righteousness. In the words of Edward Fisher, he, he wrote the, the marrow of modern divinity in the 17th century. He said, if you desire to be justified before God, you must either bring him a perfect righteousness of your own and wholly renounce Christ, or else you must bring the perfect righteousness of Christ and wholly renounce your own. So for those who renounce their own righteousness and receive the righteousness of Christ through faith, this righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Remember, God requires us to be as righteous as Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate, which means that we must be righteous and always do right. Therefore, our only hope is Jesus Christ who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So let's return to where I began. How do you know you're a Christian? Well, one preacher said, you know you're a Christian when, the, when righteousness is the pattern of your life. The same preacher says in another place, I don't look for a past event to make my salvation real to me. I look at the present pattern of my life. Some people have false assurance because they can remember a past event, but their life doesn't follow a righteous pattern. So don't worry if you can't tie in a specific time or event with the moment of salvation. Focus on your lifestyle instead. While I agree with the sentiment... I disagree with the prescription. I agree with the problem of false assurance that has come to many due to a one-time event. Going down an aisle, saying a prayer. I agree that the Christian's life will be changed from one degree of glory to another. But here's my concern. How righteous must my life be for me to gain assurance based on the righteous pattern of my life? How righteous must I be to be sure I'm a Christian? Well, our lives will be changed in Christ. The pattern of our lives is not the first, nor is it the foremost place we should look to for assurance. I mean, don't hear me wrong. For those who are in Christ, there will be transformation. There will be certain marks that characterize the Christian life. 
There are fruits of faith, such as love for God, hatred of sin, a desire to obey God's law, a love for God's word, and a love for God's people. If these are absent, you should have no, you have no reason to think that you belong to God. But these marks are what some refer to as the secondary, subjective grounds of assurance, whereas the objective, primary grounds of assurance is the very God who saves sinners. In the words of Scott Clark, the first ground of our assurance is the gospel promise. The first grounds of assurance is not the pattern of our lives. The first ground of our assurance is to look to the Savior whose pattern of life was absolutely perfect. Think about that. Our first grounds of assurance is not to look to the pattern of our lives, but to look to our Savior whose life was absolutely perfect. If we look solely to the pattern of our lives, we can be easily misled. Even the non-believer can reform his life. You see, man in his natural state might have a desire to stop being a drunk. Therefore, he does all he can to modify his behavior. He was once an abusive drunk. Now he's gentle and sober. Is that what we mean by the pattern of our righteousness? Well, that's someone who's not even looking to God through faith. Am I to look to behavior modification? What am I to look to? Does the Bible say that the righteous will live by his own personal righteousness? Is that what Romans 1, quoting from Habakkuk, says? The righteous will live by his own personal righteousness? No, you know the verse. The righteous will live by what? By faith. The Christian life, as we learn from Scripture, is characterized by faith. The righteous shall live by faith in the righteous one. And it's in him that we're justified and sanctified. We're not justified by our sanctification. We're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. At the end of the day, you'll either focus on Jesus, the law keeper, or on your own personal obedience. The latter breeds doubt and wavering. How obedient must I be to know I'm a Christian? What if I disobeyed just this morning? Am I truly in Christ? How righteous must I be to have assurance? This also breeds self-righteousness because we always lower the standard, especially when we think we're capable of holding the law. And therefore we say things like, thank God I'm not like this tax collector and sinner. When our eye is off the law keeper, it's easy for us to focus on the sins of the world. And then we feel good about ourselves because I'm not as vile as they are. But when we focus on the law keeper, we recognize just how great the law's demands are and how great a savior he is. When we focus on the law keeper, we'll be humbled because he not only obtained a righteousness that is sufficient for all his elect, but he also became a curse for his elect. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, became a curse on our behalf. He took up the law's curse for unrighteous sinners such as you and I. So the question is this, to whom will you look to for assurance? To Christ or to yourself? We have the tendency to look first and foremost to ourselves to look first and foremost to our inner renewal or to the fruits of our transformation. And while there is a place for this, I'm not casting that out. Remember, this is the secondary, subjective grounds for our assurance. And it's this look, looking to ourselves, is why so many struggle with doubt and anxiety over the state of their soul because how much evidence will ever be enough? Especially when perfect righteousness is the standard. How righteous must I be to know that I'm a Christian? I read one man who said this. Herein lies the paradox. We want to talk and think about how to get better evidences 
But if we get a better grip of Christ, then the evidences will flow like fruit. They will grow like fruit. We want to talk and think about how to get better evidences, but if we get a better grip of Christ, then the evidences will grow like fruit. So the first place we should turn and keep turning back to is to God who promised and who accomplished our redemption in Christ and by his spirit. Some of the sweetest words in all of scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the question is, whose righteousness are you resting in? In Christ or your own? Our assurance is ultimately in God who does not lie. In God who establishes covenants with man and fulfills his end of the covenant through Christ, who accomplished all the work that was set before him. Remember, there is no assurance in the law. The law doesn't give you that. There's no assurance in your ability to keep the law. Therefore, look to Christ, keep looking to him, and rest in his righteousness. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Christ. And sometimes, I think often, we ought to say, how can it be that you, my God, would die a sinner. Now counting me righteous as though I achieved this on my own. Removing my sin, pardoning our sin in Christ as though we paid for our sin. Oh, help us to get a better grip of Christ, to look to Christ and his righteousness. And yes, I pray that that evidence would flow, that we, our lives would be changed, that we would be those who love you, who hate sin, who walk in your ways, who delight in your word and in your truth. But I pray that we continually come back to Christ and do all of that through faith, not through a legal spirit trying to prove ourselves or trying to prove whether we are Christians or whether we're in the faith, but that we would look to you, rest in your promises, and rest in your amazing grace. And I pray this in no other name, but in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So in just a few minutes, we'll partake of the Lord's Supper. I believe it's all. Yeah. I didn't even look earlier to see if it was there. But the Lord's Supper is a meal that takes the focus off of us. The Lord's Supper is not about us and our work. The Lord's Supper is about Christ and his righteous work. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11. We won't look at much here, but I just want to reinforce some of the things that we have been talking about already. 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to read verses 23 and 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So when we eat of this bread, we remember the body that bore our sins, the righteous son of God bearing the sins of the unrighteous. When we eat, that's what we remember. Verse 25, in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So when we drink the cup, We remember the blood that was shed to secure our redemption and to establish the new covenant, a covenant in which the ungodly are made righteous through faith. 
Therefore, impenitent sinners are excluded from this ordinance. That means anyone who is working to obtain righteousness apart from faith is excluded. Do not take of the table. It's dangerous. It's deadly. You eat and drink judgment on yourself. Also, those who are defiant or who refuse to come to Christ through faith are excluded from the table. Therefore, as always, we invite our members, members of Providence in good standing, you are free to take and you should partake. For those who are visiting, if you're a baptized believer, member in good standing of an evangelical church, you're welcome to join with us. But if you plan to visit for a while, please speak with one of our elders before next month when we partake of the Lord's Supper again. And so just a couple of reminders before we pass out the elements. The Lord's Supper is the new covenant meal. It's the sign of the new covenant. And it serves to strengthen our faith as Christ ministers to us through partaking of this ordinance. When we partake of the visible elements by faith, we inwardly receive and feed on Christ crucified and all the benefits of his death, burial, and resurrection. And in this way, the Lord's Supper serves to renew our confidence in Christ's righteousness, which is imputed to us. Remember, the Lord's Supper takes our focus off of us, puts it on Christ and his righteousness and what he has accomplished. Another reminder is when the deacons come forward, just before I forget, when they pass out the cup. Remember, the purple cup contains wine. Clear cup contains grape juice. And as they pass out these elements, I encourage you, as verse 28 says, let a person examine himself. And then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. But this examination ought not lead to this being a funeral meal. This is a banquet. This is a joyous feast. Because you are the recipient of all the blessings of the new covenant. The believer can examine his sin in light of God's grace. Edward Fisher, I I quoted from him earlier, but I like this on the Lord's Supper. The more sinful you see yourself to be, the more need you will see yourself to have of Christ. And the more need you see yourself to have of Christ, the more you will prize him. And the more you prize Christ, the more you will desire him. And the more you desire Christ, the more fit and worthy receiver of the Lord's Supper you will be. So you examine yourself in light of God's grace, in light of who Christ is. And so as we are are remembering and thinking of who we are, the sin, confessing the sin we have, we are looking to Christ and we are delighted that he would save sinners like us, that he would pour out his blood for you and me. Don't stop on the vileness. Stop with the Savior who died for vile creatures such as you and me, and now who invites us to partake of his table. So deacons, if you will.
in the same manner that Jesus did, we will return thanks. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you in Christ's name by the power of your Spirit, and we thank you. Thank you for what these elements represent. The body, the righteous Lamb of God, dying for the unrighteous, and the blood procuring the new covenant, the new covenant of grace in which we stand. And we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So take and eat this bread in remembrance of Christ who died for you. Now take and drink the cup in remembrance of Christ whose blood was shed for you. And now we will sing a closing hymn. So if you'll turn to 389 in your hymnal. Three eighty nine, we'll sing together all I have is Christ in response to the the message that Corey gave us. It's a great song that shows the life uh, before becoming a Christian and then a uh, life after uh, being saved. And so let us uh, encourage each other uh, by singing this together. Why don't we stand together? All I have is Christ.
will now may he who rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son fill you with all knowledge so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord so to please him in all respects bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Amen. Amen.